Can we thank David for putting that together? That was amazing. <laughs> It's one of my favorite announcement videos you've ever done. I can watch that over and over and over again, especially the baby, like, oh my goodness. Uh, so again, I wanna remind you, at eight o'clock is, is donuts, and for clarification, uh, we, we got some pushback. Uh, people want more than one slice of pizza. And so, uh, shocking, right? You know, like we didn't see that coming. So what we've told people is uh, moving forward, we're gonna order extra pizza. First slice is free, then it's just donation only. So if uh, people wanna be able to do that, yes, you can come with your teenage kids, and they can eat as long as you can help provide for them. So glad that you are here, you know, on this day. Welcome to Super Bowl Sunday, or as I often call, the second Thanksgiving in America with the people you really want to hang out with, you know. So that's kind of what it's become, a cultural phenomenon in our culture. So uh, by noise or hands, uh, how many of you guys are cheering for the 49ers? 49ers? Okay, still so 49ers fans. Okay, how many of you guys are cheering for Taylor Swift? I mean, the Chiefs? You know, the, the Chiefs, Taylor Swift, I can't figure out which one. Uh, how many of you guys are just cheering for good commercials or halftime show? Okay, okay. And my favorite, how many of you don't care at all? Yeah, yeah, that has won, you know, um, there throughout the entire day. Uh, that has won. Uh, in preparation for this uh, weekend, I was uh, thinking about our series, and I said, hey, this is going to line up perfectly if it works out right, because today we are looking at the city of Philadelphia. But not that one, you know. Uh, unfortunately, we're looking at this one, uh, and that's all there is. In fact, I was telling Carolina when I went to Turkey, where Philadelphia uh, was located, I couldn't remember going there. I actually looked through all the little slides and the different things, and I'm like, did I even go to Philadelphia? And uh, we spent like 30 minutes there, because there just isn't much to see except these two pillars. And the pillars are going to be important as we look at what God has to say to us. Now, let me give you some background and understanding. The original purpose, even though it's very small today, the original purpose of Philadelphia was uh, it was the, the, one of the main places of spreading Hellenism throughout the known world. Now, Hellenism is Greek language, thought, and culture. The Romans uh, took upon that same kind of ideology, and so they thought as, saw it as a very strategic place. And so you can see where it's located. It's about 40 miles. If that gives you an idea from Laodicea, which is where we'll end our series you know, next week. Now, it, its name in history is significant because it's gonna tie into what we're gonna talk about in a second. The, the city itself was founded uh, by, uh, in the second century BC by Attalus II. Uh, he ruled from 159 to 138. The reason that's important is because his brother was in the Senate and he, they, they asked him, so they said, hey, can you kick out your brother? Can you kind of put him to the side? Even can you kill him? And he said, absolutely not. And word got out. And so he got a surname called Phil, uh, Philadelphus, which means brotherly love. So the city is Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And so they named the city after his act of good deed towards a family member. So that's where we got the idea, where he got the name uh, Philadelphia from. Now in 17 AD, we've talked about this two or three weeks in a row. There's a massive earthquake that hit the region. Uh, and so it just decimated the city. And, but unlike some of the other cities, because of its proximity to the epicenter, I mean, it just leveled the place that the only things that were remaining were pillars, to which you see two of which, as I showed you, you know, today. Now, when this happened, uh, who was in charge at the time in 1780 was Tiberius, who was the second Roman Caesar on the throne. Now, he sees the value, once again, of the city's strategic location. So he says, okay, you guys don't have to pay tribute or taxes for the next five years. In fact, we're going to dump a bunch of money into the city. And because I'm going to put so much money into the city, I'm going to rename it from Philadelphia to Neo Caesarea. Then six short years later, in 23 AD, there's another earthquake that hits during uh, Emperor Cyr uh, Nero's reign, and the city changed its name back to Philadelphia. Then in the 70s, guess what happened? Another earthquake. You know, you think that they would start learning after a while. Uh, Vespasian is now on the, on the throne, and he pours once again a ton of money back into the city, and he names the city from Philadelphia to Favia, which is his wife's name because of the money he was putting into. Then in 92 AD, Caesar Domitian was on the throne. In 96 AD, when he was assassinated, the people changed it back once again to Philadelphia. Now, a cultural piece that kind of unlocks this once again is to understand that the Jews at the time were under great pressure by the Romans to worship Caesar. Caesar says, I'm God and you must worship me and pay tribute and sacrifice to me. 
But because of the Jews' obstinance in their writings and because they could not change their thought of being able to worship in different parts of the Roman Empire, they actually gave them a pass. But the pass was this. Instead of praying to Caesar, we'll give you a pass as long as you pray for Caesar. Instead of saying, here's a sacrifice to Caesar, can you offer a sacrifice for Caesar? They said yes, and thus they were given a pass and were not under the same persecution that happened to the Christians. Because once they became Christians, many of them were became Messianic Jews, and it was the Jews who ratted them out. It was the Jews who said, look, Roman, these people are not under our protection. They should be persecuted. And so the persecution that these Christians received, especially in places like Philadelphia, actually caused great pain, heartache, suffered job loss, ostracization from family, simply because they refused to worship Caesar. So just a a little bit of background in some of those things. Uh, Other things is that to Philadelphia and Smyrna, which is what we talked about a couple weeks ago, it's the only letters where Jesus only has praise for them, no correction. He has rebuke for the city and for other people, but not actually to the church people. Now, there must have been a lot of Jews at this church because if you just read this without any context, what we're about to read in just a second, it's very confusing because there are six references in these seven verses that go back to our Old Testament in Isaiah. So you have to understand Isaiah to understand what he's really talking about. In fact, Brad talked to us about a few weeks ago. If you really want to understand the entire book of Revelation, there's over 400 either specific scriptural examples, illustrations, or metaphors that go back to our Old Testament. And so to understand Revelation, sometimes we look at it through just New Testament eyes, but you actually have to understand the Old Testament understand the entire book. So with that being said, let's just read a little bit slower than I have in the previous few weeks, and I'm going to unpack a little bit more before we actually go into our preaching time. So verse 7, write this letter to the church of uh, the angel of the church in Philadelphia. This is the message from the one who is holy and true. Now there's two Greek words that are translated true into the English language. One is true and not false. You remember say somebody, is this true or false? The other Greek word is true or not fake. And that's what this is. This one is true and not fake, not true and not false. In other words, Jesus is saying, look, I am holy, I am set apart. I'm the real deal. I am the one who's in charge. I am the one who is true that you can put your trust into. Then he says, the one, Jesus, who has the key of David. That's an interesting phrase. What he opens, no one can close, and what he closes, no one can open. Now, the key of David is the one who's in charge of God's kingdom and his rule. He says, if you have the keys and coming from the line of David is where the the Messiah, God, is going to come from, that's prophesied in the Old Testament, and so whoever's in charge is in charge of the kingdom, which means they're in charge of God's kingdom. And this is first mentioned. We go back to Isaiah chapter 22, and the Jews would know this. It says, and then I will call my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, to replace you. I will dress him in your royal robes and will give him your title and your authority. And he will be a father to the people of Jerusalem and Judah. This is what he tells him. I will give him the key to the house of David. So it's his to own. He's going to give him the key, the highest position in the royal court. When he opens doors, no one will be able to close them. When he closes doors, no one will be able to open them. So what he's saying is, look, I'm in charge. I have the key. I'm the one that's opening and closing doors. I know it doesn't seem that way based on what you're experiencing in this city, but he's bringing them great encouragement and great perspective. And for them to understand this, they're like, okay, here's what I'm experiencing, but what I'm experiencing is my perception, but what's real is Jesus is in charge. That's the encouragement he's given. Uh, Then he says, I know all the things that you do, And I have opened a door for you that no one can close. You have little strength, yet you've obeyed my word and did not deny me. Look, I will force those who belong to Satan's synagogue, those liars who say they are Jews but are not, to come and bow down at your feet. They will acknowledge that you are the ones that I love. So he says this phrase, the second time we've read this now in the last couple weeks, this synagogue of Satan. What in the world is synagogue of Satan? In short, the synagogue of Satan was a group of unbelieving Jews, which is why it's called the synagogue, who were persecuting Christians or handing them over to the Romans to be persecuted. 
And so if you're not for Jesus, you're against them. And here are the very people who feel like that they're honoring God by trying to uphold Judaism. But in fact, they find themselves fighting against God and against his kingdom by persecuting his people. So Jesus is not kind when he says, actually, in the same way that he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan, because you're not, I'm not following man's will, man's desires in this one instance. I'm following what God wants me to do, and I'm going to follow my will, my way, because I'm in charge. Then he goes on you know, uh, to say that they will bow down at your feet. What an interesting phrase. Bow our feet. That goes back again to Isaiah chapter 60, where we first read this. In Isaiah 60, it says these words. It says, the descendants of your tormentors will come and bow before you. Those who despise you will kiss your feet. They will call you the city of the Lord and Zion of the Holy One of Israel. He's talking about Jerusalem, by the way. Though you were once despised and hated with no one traveling through you, I will make you beautiful forever, a joy to all generations. Powerful kings and mighty nations will satisfy your every need as though you were a child nursing at the breast of a queen. You will know at last that I, the Lord, am your savior, your redeemer, the mighty one of Israel. And so they're sitting back going, okay, this is what I'm talking about. I'm suffering this persecution and this heartache, but one day, one day, Every knee is going to bow. One day, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so he's, he wants to encourage them to hold on and to continue to move forward. Okay, I want to start preaching, but I got to hold back. Shh, hold back. Okay, verse 10. Because you have obeyed my command to persevere, I will protect you from the great time of testing that will come upon the whole world to test those who belong to this world. Now, is this referencing the end times of all days or just the persecution that's going to come to this region that he's going to protect them from? We honestly don't know. We don't know exactly one another. There's a case that can be made from both. But what we do know is that this testing can also be translated as tempting for those specifically not connected to Jesus. He, we do know that he's going to test those who belong to this world. And whatever the world chooses and the consequences, these people specifically are going to be spared from any further than what they've already been treated to up to this point based on the Romans and what's taking place. That's what we do know. He's giving them hope to say, hang in there. In fact, he even says right after this, verse 11, I'm coming soon. Let me give you some perspective. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. Now that word hold on literally means to hold on with dear life. Like you're tired. It's, it's this, this idea of like, okay, I'm exhausted. I'm at the end. It's like, you know, we're at the end of the Super Bowl and those guys in the field are just exhausted. Just like, hold on. These people are wanting to give up. They're wanting to give in. And Jesus is saying, hold on just a little bit longer, just a little bit longer, because a crown is coming. And so the crown he's talking about is not a crown that's given to royalty based on royal birth. It is a crown of victory. This is the crown that he is promising them if they would just continue to hold on. And so he's encouraging his saints to finish the race to finish the struggle, to finish the fight. You know, if we're talking about the Super Bowl, it's like, it's the end of the game. You want to give up. You want to give in. Never give up. Never give in. And hold on. There's a crown that's about ready to come. God's not done. Okay, don't preach yet. Okay, got a little bit longer. Okay, verse 12. All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of my God, and they will never have to leave it. So as you know, pillars is what holds up buildings. And what holds up pillars is the foundation. Jesus, through scripture, reminds us that he is the foundation to which our lives are built upon. And we are the pillars that remain strong as we have our foundation in him. And then he says, and I will write on them the name of my God, and they will be citizens in the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from my God. Now, what's fascinating is in the city of Philadelphia, they honored their illustrious sons by writing and inscribing their names on pillars in temple worship. And so Jesus is saying, hey, you know how popular these guys are that get their names written on these pillars. I have names that are, written, are going to be written for you that other people are going to see for all eternity as you remain strong in me. No earthquake's going to take it out. 
No, and what a reminder today, if you go to Philadelphia, that all that remains are two pillars. And that what a reference that Jesus is making here. And then he says, and I will also write on them my new name. Here's a, church, here's a city that's gone through name changes for generations. And he's saying there is one name, no more changing names. It's about permanence. It's about stability. It's about being in him, which is a direct reference to Isaiah 62 verse 2. It says, the nations will see your righteousness. World leaders will be blinded by your glory. Here's the proclamation of who you are, and you will be given a new name by the Lord's own mouth. So what a reference, an everlasting name forever and ever. And then he finishes, as he's done with all the rest of the letters, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and to understand what he is saying to the churches, right? And so it's written to this church, It's supposed to be circulated amongst the churches, but it's in our scriptures for us to also say, okay, what are we supposed to hear, learn, and then yes, what are we supposed to apply? So how does this apply to us? See, on this Super Bowl Sunday, there's gonna be a battle on the field, and I wanna remind you that as you may be watching or being entertained by, that all of us are in a battle. You and I are at a regular war. Many times we don't even think about it because we're just going through our lives, but we are in a regular battle and a regular war. And if you're like me, you wanna win. You wanna be victorious. You wanna end up on the right side. And what's fascinating about this passage is that Jesus gives us some things that'll help us to make sure that we live in victory in him. And so here's what he says. He says, first, you need to fight. Fight for the souls of those who don't yet know him. This is what he says when he says in verse eight, I have opened a door for you that no one can close. Did you know that in every time in the New Testament, the word open door is mentioned, it is always preceded or or, or afterwards, it is mentioned that it's about the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about, an open door. We pray for open doors, right? But do you realize that almost all the times in the New Testament, open doors isn't for our comfort and our satisfaction or even sometimes finding out God's will. It's an open door of opportunity to proclaim him. So let me give you a few examples. Colossians 4, 3. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am chains. 2 Corinthians 2, 12. When I came to the city of Tereus to preach the good news of Christ, the Lord opened a door of opportunity for me. First Corinthians 16, nine. There is a wide open door for a great work here, although many oppose me. And it goes on and on. In its history, Philadelphia had an incredible evangelic, evangelistic opportunity to spread Hellenism through the known world. And Jesus is reminding that church in Philadelphia, you have the same opportunity, not for the kingdom of Rome, but for my kingdom. And these people that are gonna travel through this town of Philadelphia will also encounter you. And as they come to you, you have a door of opportunity to fight for the souls of those who've not yet received me, even as you're fighting for your very lives representing me. And you and I have the same opportunity. Do you realize the, the, the incredible gift that God has given us to continue in a free country, to proclaim the message of Jesus to all. And yes, we might suffer some persecution of people calling us names. You might get canceled here or there, but we're not dying at the sword yet. We're not being crucified. We're being kicked out of countries, you know, because of our belief in Jesus. And so he's given us a unique time in all of history. America's what, a couple hundred years old? To be able to proclaim the message freely to fight for the souls of people, and also the resources to be able to proclaim that message to the world. We can visit places in the world where they can't can't leave their, their country because they're followers of Jesus Christ. And we can go there, and we can proclaim, and we can encourage. God has given us this opportunity, and he's saying, fight. Fight for these people. Fight for the ones who cannot fight for themselves. Represent me well. I hold the keys of the kingdom and I'm giving them to you. The doors are open. It's not your job to convince anybody to follow Jesus Christ. It's only our opportunity and yes, responsibility to share that good news unapologetically because of how much we care in word or deed. Now, I don't know about you. It's easy for me to share with people I love. It's really hard for me to share 
with people who irritate the crap out of me. And I don't think I'm alone, <laughs> right? So 49er fans, share with Chief fans. Chief fans, you gotta love and share 49er fans. Republicans, it means you actually have to care about Democrats. Democrats, you gotta care about Republicans. But you're like, those people irritate me. Those people drive me insane. My boss, my employer, my employee, my neighbor, my friend, whatever me. Those people, but Dan, you don't understand. You're right, I don't understand. I've got other people in my life that you don't understand either. But I need to remind you in the words of Phineas from Hunger Games, remember who the real enemy is. Let's go back to Ephesians because it's not people. Ephesians chapter six, it says these words, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor. You don't put on armor unless you're ready to go into battle so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. There's the real enemy. For we are not fighting against people against flesh and blood enemies, but against the evil rulers and the authorities of the unseen world, against the mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. This is hard because you don't see those manifestations. You see people. And so we think they're the enemy. They're not the enemy. And so here's the crazy part. Jesus was asking the church in Philadelphia to care about people who are killing them and persecuting them, and ostracizing them, and say, still represent me. The door of opportunity is before you. And Jesus has asked us to do the same. To say, we are in a fight. We are in a battle. But we want to begin to understand our battle is not on the gridiron. It's for the souls and the lives of people. So to experience victory, we got to see these open doors and walk through with confidence, knowing that he has provided the open door before us. Secondly, how do we receive victory? Well, we gotta grow in reliance and dependence on Jesus. He says this in verse eight, you have little strength and yet you obeyed my word and did not deny me. They held on. As we've talked about these earthquakes that Philadelphia suffered and the collapsing of these, these, these buildings and the pillars that remain, Jesus offers us the same strength to remain standing in the midst of things that would crush normal people in life. You're gonna go through hard times. You're gonna go through difficulty. In fact, when life gets hard, when the earthquake levels our lives, God sees the struggle. He sees what we're going through and he wants us to encourage us by saying, hold on, continue to rely and depend on me. The key is, are we growing in those things to grow in dependence and, and reliance on him? There's this idea out there and I've heard it even recently and, and sometimes I've even believed it that God's primary purpose when we follow him is if we're aligned with him, he's gonna make us happy. That he's gonna make us comfortable. That his, God's primary purpose is going to bless us in our dreams and our finances and those kinds of things. And I can tell you from the bottom of my heart, it could be further from the truth. Does he not want you to be happy? No, 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 don't mishear me on that. But let me be absolutely clear. If you've, read, if you've gone through this series with us and if you read through the entire New Testament, You'll understand this, Jesus never, the God of the universe who is in control of all things, never says, hey, when you come to me, I'm gonna take away pain and suffering. I'm gonna take that out of your life. Over and over and over, including in this, this, this instance right here, you think, okay, if anybody deserves a break, it's this church in Philadelphia. And he doesn't say, you know what? Thanks for trusting in me. I'm gonna remove the suffering. He doesn't say that. He says, hold on. He gives us the strength he gives us the perspective. He gets us the perseverance to get through. Now, the question we ask all the time is why? Because he wants us to be dependent on him. And oftentimes, it's only through the struggle that we actually grow in the depth of what we really need so that when the storms of life come, we're able to stand. Many of us as Christians, Americans, we rely and depend on God when the storm happens. And so we exhaust all of our other resources. We exhaust all of our other ways of taking care of something. And then when it doesn't happen, then we're like, God, whew, I need to turn to you. You're almost like my backup plan. And God says, no, no, no. I want to be your pre-planning in the midst of the battle and after as well. I want you to rely on me. This last week, I was uh, at my men's group and, and Reed uh, decided to give a little devotional to our guys. And, and he said something I had never thought of before. Uh, when he reminded us of a story that's fairly familiar, it's mentioned in three of our Gospels, 
In Mark chapter five, it says these words, a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them, but that she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. This is the only mention where there's one line in here that's not in the other two examples, and that is she paid everything she had to the doctors, but she got worse. Finally, when she was running out of her own dependence and self-reliance, she says, well, maybe this Jesus person can heal me. She goes up to Jesus, touches the hem of his robe, and she's instantly healed. And Reed made the point, and I agree with them, that's us as Americans. We, when we're going through something in our lives, we go to our resources first. We go to our finances We go to our connections, we go to our doctors, we go to our nurses, we go to our knowledge, we go to our experience, none of which is bad, don't mishear me. All of those things are gifts that God has provided, but where's the reliance on him? Because what God is saying is, I want you to come to me before. I want you to come to me during. I want you to come to me after. I want you to grow in the midst of what you're going through, a reliance and a dependence on me. This last week, I was listening uh, to a podcast, and uh, John Mark Comer was on there, and, and uh, he's become kind of a fan of mine. Uh, I'm fan, well, I don't know if he's become a fan of mine. That's pretty awesome, actually, if that's true. John Mark Comer, he loves me, you know, just, uh, just so you know. Uh, third service, this is what happens. Uh, but I actually become a fan of his. We, we did a series, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, as well. They're gonna, you're going to hear a little bit more about him, but he's, he's really done some great research and it's tried to discover what are the levels or layers of somebody's depth of relationship with Jesus. And what he points out over studying the entire world is there's some things that we can see and understand that we do really well as Americans and there's some other areas we could grow in. So as American Christians, uh, he identified, and I agree with him, that there's three areas that we do really well just across the board as American churches. Number one, introducing Jesus to other people. That we proclaim. There's a lot of people who've heard the name of Jesus, who've proclaimed, who come to faith on a regular basis, and I'm thinking, yeah, we do that pretty well. Uh, the second thing that he, said, that he talks about is the gathering of the saints, the gathering of people together. I'm like, yeah, you see churches, they, they have people that come to them, and they, and they worship, or even in smaller groups. He's like, yeah, you know, American churches do really well at that. He goes, the third area that they grow in is, and you see this exemplified in the American church, is the importance of being a part of the body, importance of serving, importance of giving. And we see American churches and our church, and I'm thinking, check, check, check. And then he goes, then for many American Christians, there seems to be a wall or a barrier to the next three. And the next three are one, a growth in deep prayer. Because we are so busy, there are, they call them spiritual disciplines that help push these things like silence and solitude and Sabbath and fasting and these kinds of things. What's the purpose of all those things? To grow us in a deeper, intimate prayer dependence on him. And as Americans, we're so busy, it kind of pushes against our culture and it makes us hard to go to that next layer of relationship with him. The second is actually, and you'll see it more than in men than others, is finding one other person where you have a deep partnership in the gospel in each other's lives. In other words, you have a deep abiding relationship that who knows you really, but spurs you on to become more like Jesus. It's more than a small group, but they're like, I care about you. I pray for you. You're going to pray for me. All of these things help in dependence and reliance of Jesus. And then he lists the third one that I don't even like to talk about. He goes, the third one is suffering. It's suffering. That when you and I suffer, why? It creates this reliance and dependence on Jesus. If you've ever met someone in a different culture or country who've gone through something simply because they were a follower of Jesus Christ, I sit in awe and humility at their feet because I don't know where they're at because I've never gone through what they've gone through. That there's something beautiful that God does in hard times and in earthquakes and in storms. As we grow in reliance on him, we become the pillars that Jesus talks about that you can still visit in Philadelphia today. In fact, it makes sense finally for why James decides to write this in James chapter one. He says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Not happiness, not yay, but there's a joy that can take place because we know not that we're going through the suffering, 
but because you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance is a chance to grow, so let it grow for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So it's good. So we're in a fight and we're fighting for people's souls and we're in, a, and we're in this spiritual battle, which means we gotta grow in a deeper reliance and a deeper dependence on him so that we can live in victory. That we can live in victory. The scoreboard's done. The game is over and we've won. And so he's reminding that church that you are victorious already. And they're looking around like, are you kidding me? We're getting our tails kicked out here, Jesus. He goes, no, no, no. The end is over. He goes, you still got a battle. You still got to play the game. You're going to still go through the ups and downs in life for your sake and for the sake of other people. But what can give you strength to continue holding on, what can give you perspective in the midst of the storm is you win because of who he is. And so you can walk out of here on this Super Bowl Sunday going, I have victory in Jesus and I can face anything because I know eventually I get to wear the crown, I get to get the new name and because I'm an overcomer in him. In 1 John chapter five, it reminds us everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God. That is our identity. Then he says, and everyone who loves the father loves his children. In other words, this whole family, this relationship with one another, it's pretty important to God. We know that we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Shouldn't be heavier or, or weighty, but don't miss this. For every child of God, defeats this evil world and we achieve this victory through our faith and who can win this battle against the world only those who believe that Jesus is the son of God amen this is what we can celebrate we have to go out and play the game we can get excited and cheer you know, our, our sports teams to no other, but do we have the same passion and zeal, understanding that we've already won, but we've won because of him. And so it allows us to face the things that we're gonna face, to create the reliance, and through the struggles that we're gonna go through, the doors of opportunity will be open because you're gonna face the difficulties of life different than how other people face them because you already know the outcome. That happens. And so when you face cancer, when you face a loss of a job, when you face loss of relationship, and yes, when you face death, you're victorious because we can mourn, but we mourn with hope because of what's to come. The question is do you believe this? Do you believe this to the core of who you are? Because if so, then we can experience the victory that we have in Jesus by choosing to remain faithful and dependent and walk through the doors of opportunity by proclaiming his message in word and deed to those around us. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this day. And for what I know is the heartache that uh, we face, you know, in this life and even as different family members in our church are going through horrendous things in sickness and in loss. Father, I pray that we can stand in victory, knowing that we can mourn, but we mourn with hope, knowing that we can cry, but we don't cry alone, and knowing that when we're at the end of ourselves, that we finally become reliant on you, that you are our strength, and every time that we see a pillar, that we are that pillar, because you're our foundation. So Father, I pray you be with everybody in this room and watching online. Lead, guide, and direct our steps in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we close today, that first step of victory is aligning with the victor. It's with Jesus. That's the victory's not ours. The victory's our faith in him. And so maybe for you, uh, heading to the cross and getting baptized after your proclamation is your next step, and I know we've got a couple of you doing it today. What an opportunity also for us to remember what God has placed before us. And so for the rest of us, if you need prayer, go there, but we're gonna sing a closing song of victory. And I pray that these words that may be familiar to some of you will have a new and a deeper meaning. And for those of you who've never heard these words before, that you'll just kind of nod in agreement and use this song as a prayer 
to him. Will you stand with me as we sing this song to him? Let's sing this together. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. You turn.